Come in. Hi, babe. Look who's returned. Not exactly in triumph. Oh, come on. To what do I owe the pleasure? I'm back. And so? And so I wanted to see you. What for? What for? You're my closest friend. I've, I've missed you. <laughs> You have only yourself to blame for that. Oh, come on, babe. Let's not get into that again. So what are you going to do now that you're back in Chicago? Going to grad school in September. Have you chosen a profession? No, nah, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to take some advanced courses. I'm going to Chicago Law next September. I read in the paper that you're the youngest person ever to have graduated from Ann Arbor. So I'm told. I also know that you just scraped through. That's an exaggeration. And how would you know that anyway? Took a peek at your transcript once while visiting the registrar's office. You spied on me? You lied to me. You told me you had straight A's. Still, my marks were perfectly respectable. Respectable, but hardly stellar. Stellar enough to get me into grad school. That old tutor of yours would be disappointed. T Miss Struthers? I didn't go to Ann Arbor to please her. Obviously. You think I don't know what went on with you at Michigan after you dumped me for that stupid fraternity? Max Schreyer told me everything. You were drunk every day by noon, or acting so weird that people thought you were drunk. An all-round bad example. You were even denied a mentorship over the new pledges. The new pledges were older than I was. Max told me that during initiations, you were a perfect sadist. Oh, the freshmen enjoyed it. You were hardly the supreme collegian you aspired to be. Babe, why are you being such a boring prig? I'm just disappointed, Dick. You know my opinion of you. You are the most brilliant young man of this century. When one considers your previous achievements, my god, you started college at 14. Your performance at Ann Arbor was, to say the least, mediocre. Babe, I appreciate your concern for my report card. However, that's not why you're so sore. No? Why? It's because I joined Zeta Beta Tau. It's not because you joined Zeta Beta Tau. It's because you abandoned me. Hell, I transferred from Chicago to Ann Arbor at your suggestion. You said we'd share a place, live together. But the moment that damn frat took your pledge, you were gone, left me completely in the lurch. Babe, for God's sake, all that gossip? Well, that wasn't my fault. Well. It wasn't your fault. I don't know whose fault it was. Maybe yours? You were so obvious at Charlevoix, hopping in and out of my bed in your underwear. I don't remember you objecting at the time. It was inevitable that somebody would catch us and grease the rumor mill. Jesus, they knew about us at Ann Arbor before we even got there. Exactly, babe. You didn't want those rumors any more than I did. For God's sake, everyone's saying we were a couple of cocksuckers? Zeta Beta Tau almost didn't pledge me. And they wouldn't have if I hadn't agreed to all their conditions. <laughs> Such as, never to see me. I could see you. Only in the presence of a third party. Hell, Dick, if we wanted to be together, we needed a chaperone. What a gas that was. We saw each other on the slide, just the two of us, plenty of times. That's not what you'd promised. Babe, we couldn't possibly room together. You knew that. You said it yourself. You're just sore because my move was so abrupt. If by abrupt you mean heartless, I agree. 
You could have shown some regret. Jesus, my mother had just died. I was in mourning. But the second that frat took your pledge, you were gone. A frat can be a lot of fun, babe. You should have joined one. I'm not the fraternity type. Might have done you some good to get off your high horse and just get along with people. I get along with people just fine, if they're worth getting along with. This year I had a fine social life. I was involved in all kinds of clubs, committees, special projects, dramatics. And now I'm teaching ornithology. Have students of all ages. And I've got a girl in tow. You mean Sue Lurie? Yes. Have you met her? No. I'll introduce you. She's quite attractive and intelligent. We had a splendid afternoon together in Jackson Park. I paddled, she sang and strummed the ukulele. What a cliché. We stopped at a little point of land, sat down together. I put my head in her lap and she read French poetry to me. It was a perfect afternoon. Sounds like a fucking movie. Don't be such a spoiled sport. Anyway, how are things going with the lovely Lorraine? Just fine, thank you. You saw enough of her this year? I like taking her to dances. Your perfect hometown girl. You're lucky, Dick. Lorraine is a peach. Too good for you. I don't mind having what's too good for me. So why did you say you were here? You're my closest friend. You've hardly seen me since I left Michigan. <laughs> I had you up to Charlevoix last summer. Also, last winter. You just wanted an accomplice. By no means. It was much more than that. Come on, babe. Haven't you missed me at all? After what you did? And shut up about those rumors. It wasn't just them. You wanted all that stupid frat boy stuff. The dumb jokes, the idle gossip, all that puerile tomfoolery, and you sacrificed me to get it. I didn't just want it. I needed it. Needed it? You know, babe, I get so depressed sometimes. Oh, right. You get the blues. Things can get so dark I can't stand it. I have to have people around. Then it's okay. In a frat, there's always company. If I hadn't had that, I'd probably have killed myself. Oh, don't be so melodramatic. You know you're not the only one who gets depressed. You too? What gets you down? Lots of things. Not the least is your self-centeredness. Oh, that's the pot calling the kettle black. I may be self-centered too, but I never made you suffer because of it. When you transferred back to Chicago, you left me all alone. The whole point of me going to Ann Arbor was for us to be together. It was your idea, remember? Well, we weren't together, so I left. I had a great time after I came back. My true friends were here. In that case, I envy you. Why? You had your bros at Zeta Beta Tau. They weren't such good company. What about Max Schreyer? He's your bosom buddy, isn't he? Are you kidding? He's a self-important pooba. Acted as if he ruled the frat, but dumb as all get out. What about the other guys? Oh, please. They're all full of themselves. Thought themselves better than me just because they were older. You seemed chummy enough with all of them. The operative word is seemed. I always behaved as if I liked and respected them. As if? Dick. Such a disparity between the appearance of your feelings and the reality. There's a word for that. Ha! I'll take my system of etiquette over yours any day. I may be hypocritical, but you're hurtful. You say whatever you think, no matter how offensive. At least people know where they stand with me. Yeah, and the dirt beneath your feet. You drop your friends as fast as you make them. I've never dropped you, babe. In any case, you, you haven't answered my question. What question? Have you missed me? Come on, I said that I've missed you. That must have hurt. What have you missed about me? Your companionship. My companionship? I mean all the fun we had together, our capers. And you appreciate me, Nathan. Nobody appreciates me like you do. As I do. You bring out the best in me. Come on, babe. Haven't you missed me at all? Well, of course I've missed you. We were best friends. Our best friends. Come on, now that I'm back, we can have so much fun. Holy cow, do you know what I've just discovered? What? You know that Mopsy drives a Milburn Electric? Yes. Well, I just discovered that the keys of one Milburn fit all Milburns. <laughs> You're kidding. Nope. It'll be a cinch to steal another. Maybe half a dozen. Oh, I, I don't know, Dick. I don't get the same thrill from crime as you do. 
Oh, oh, come on, you told me about when you were a kid. You stole stamps from that other boy's album. Well, sure I did, but I didn't do it for the thrill of it. I wanted those stamps. I was entitled to them. I knew much more about stamp collecting than he did. <laughs> what about when you stole from that neighbor kid? You didn't want that money. You didn't even spend it. You hid it in the shed and forgot about it. You got away with that theft. Didn't that thrill you? I suppose I had a minor sense of satisfaction. You don't appreciate crime, Nathan. A crime properly planned and executed is a beautifully complex and intricate system. Like one of those fantastic Arabic ceilings. I'll admit there is a certain interest in committing crimes, though for me it's more scientific than aesthetic. Exactly, babe. Crime is an amazing laboratory of human psychology, and you have no moral objections to crime? Oh, certainly not. A morally superior individual is under no obligations to obey the laws of society. He makes his own laws. Exactly. Come on, babe, now that I'm back, I'm so ready to carry out all sorts of fantastic schemes. And you want me to help? Don't you want to help me? And to admire. Well, sure, why not? Hmm. We've always done it together. I've never pulled a caper without you. I can't even imagine it. Okay, okay, I'll do it. That's great, babe. We'll be just like we were in the old days. Uh. Dick, there was something else that Schreyer told me. What? He said that, well, at ZBT, you were liable to fainting spells. That jerk. Are you okay? Of course I'm okay. It didn't sound like ordinary fainting to me. Look, on very rare occasions, I get a little lightheaded, that's all. Have you seen a doc? Of course I have. I got into a car accident a few years ago. I, I had a concussion. I'm perfectly fine now. I'd be obliged if you didn't mention it again, and don't you dare mention it to anyone else, you hear? Okay. You interested in heading down to the Drake? I have to head home now. Why? Momsy and Popsy are expecting me for dinner. Well, what are you doing after? Going to see Lorraine. Ah. See you tomorrow? Okay. What time? I'll phone. Okay. See you tomorrow. And hey, if conditions are right, I'll purloin Mopsy's keys so we can steal Milburn. Who knows, it might hit the papers. <laughs>
I jump on that streetcar and away I go. Well, then I look around and you're not there. I don't run as fast as you. I couldn't catch that trolley, so I had to hide. And those garage men came snooping around as mad as hell, and, and I was crouching in that alley, holding my breath. You should have run faster. I have shorter legs than you have. And flatter feet. You're safe and sound now. Just kick back and enjoy it. We stole a car and got away with it. I guess I'm having trouble appreciating the thrill. You mean you don't get an incredible rush? Well, sure I do, Dick, but I'm not sure that the rush is worth the danger. My God, jumping out of a moving car and leaving it to crash? What do you say we go back and take a look? What are you talking about? Come on, let's go downtown and see the wreck. We'll put on some different clothes. Oh, the Dick, I don't know about that. Come on, they'll never recognize us. There. Unrecognizable. Let's go. We'll stand by and watch the cops puzzling over the wreck, but we and we alone will know who was responsible. We can approach the police and claim to be witnesses. We'll pretend to help them, but all the while it'll be us, the perpetrators, sending them on a wild goose chase. They'll be suspicious. The cops are too dumb to suspect anything. Just think, babe. We'll be Police and reporters and the public all standing around asking what happened and who the thieves were. And only we will know the truth. It's not worth the risk. Good God, babe, how can you say that? Let's go. Oh. The goal of evolution is not man, but Superman, what Nietzsche calls the Ubermensch. Man as we know him is just the stage between the animal and the Superman. So, Superman evolve? Uh, no, superior individuals dare to become Supermen. How? By creating their own values, out of their own vitality and strength, and all for the satisfaction of their own desires. In other words, whatever they desire is for them a moral imperative. So they can do whatever they want? They must do whatever they want. Lie? Steal? Cheat? Kill? All that. How could anybody be under a moral imperative for things like that? There's an objective, universal prohibition against them. No, there isn't. Why do you say so? Because there's no God. The only possible source of an objective, universal ethics, would be God, and he doesn't exist. How do you know? Well, look around you, Dick. Read Schopenhauer. No God could have created such an insane, pointless universe. If I ever had any doubt about it, my mother's death would have convinced me. She was the finest woman I ever knew. You ever see a picture of a Renaissance Madonna? That's the kind of woman she was. Her passing was such a senseless waste. If the world is so futile and absurd, there can't be a god. So where do we get our ideas of moral good and evil? From the Jews, ultimately. Our people? Certainly. The the Jewish priests invented the concept of sin to justify their enslavement to the Babylonians. They had rebelled against God. Slavery was their punishment and the lesson they had to learn. Their salvation would be to adopt the stance of slaves, impotent, submissive, fearful. The Christians perfected this morality. And the Superman? The Superman ignores the slave morality of the masses. He creates his own values and does whatever his superior nature prompts. He is totally immune from any and all conventional restraints. Hmm. Furthermore, because the Superman cannot be bound by popular morality, he is free. And he must be free to follow his own instincts. He rejoices in his own life force, in his own naked experience. He grasps the true life of immediate perception in, in all its rawness. He says yes to real life and unmediated experience. He rejoices in all of its force, beauty, and, and even terror. Terror? Yes, uh, think of Greek tragedy. It turns the horrors of life into a thing of beauty. All those thefts and rapes and murders? Yes, the Greeks affirmed all of it. All of life, every aspect of life. 
I guess that's why Sophocles said the best thing for a man is never to have been born. Sophocles was very old and enervated when he wrote that. Well then, here's something we can rejoice in. I have a friend who lives in a rather grand house in Hubbard Woods. He and his folks are going out of town this weekend. And you want, I suppose, to commit a burglary. Listen, they have a fantastic wine cellar. Rare wines worth a fortune. Sounds quite worthwhile for a change. Yes, our escapade with the Milburn Electric didn't hit the papers, but the theft of several dozen priceless bottles of wine? For sure we'll be reading about that. It does sound promising. Which bag has the rope? This one. Good. If we encounter the maid, we'll tie her up with that. If she makes too much of a fuss, I'll knock her out with my toy. Now check your gun. Why? I loaded it at home. Let me see. Good. Now show me yours. Mine is fine. Show me. I want to know that I'm properly covered. Oh, for God's sake. Right. Good. Now, if we encounter the Night Watchman, shoot to kill. Babe, the wine cellar is down there. Beautiful. Look at all those bottles. What a collection. We must take only the best, most fantastic wines. Don't worry, I know which ones those are. Well, let's get to work. When's the family back? Tonight sometime. Where's your chisel? I threw it in the grass. Where? You're here somewhere. Good God, why did you throw it in the grass? Because you insisted on checking my gun. I only have two hands. Here it is. Now let's get to work. It's ridiculous. I can't get this goddamn window open. Well, keep trying. I, I think the fucker is painted shut. Then smash the glass. Are you kidding me? We'll have the night watchman on top of us in a minute. We have our pistols. We mustn't bring the use of pistols on ourselves. Only if the night watchman comes on us unexpectedly. What? True criminals don't deliberately attract the night watchman. You might as well holler for them. Come on, let's get out of here. What? After driving all the way out here? What are you talking about? We can't get in. At least not stealthily. So let's get in unstealthily. I said no. It's got to be done silently and elegantly. We're not a couple of oafs. Let's get out of here. You can't quit. We spent days planning this robbery and reconnoitering this place. Come on, we have to go. The family will be home soon. You're just losing your nerve. I'm not losing my nerve. Listen, babe. Everything is fine. The plan has been a success. Only the execution has failed. That means that the whole job has failed. No, the pleasure is mostly in planning. Pretty bad planning if we can't get through a glass window. Listen, babe, I'm not going to argue with you. Maybe in practical terms, the job is a lost cause. Conceptually, it's a triumph. I'm perfectly satisfied. Well, I'm not. Too bad. I'm going now. If you want to stay, fine. I... <sighs> Do you know, Hump, said Wolf Larsen, that this is the first time I have heard the word ethics in the mouth of a man. You and I are the only men on this ship who know its meaning, and this is the first time I have ever heard the word pronounced. Which is all wrong, by the way, for you are wrong. It is a question neither of grammar nor ethics, but of fact. I understand, I said. The fact is that you have the money the cookie stole from me. Larson's face brightened. He seemed pleased at my perspicacity. But it is avoiding the question. I continued, which is one of right. Ah, remarked Captain Larson with a wry pucker of his mouth. I see you still believe in such things as right and wrong. But don't you? At all? I demanded. Not the least bit, said Larson. Might is right, and that is all there is to it. Weakness is wrong, which is a poor way of saying that it is good for oneself to be strong, 
and evil for oneself to be weak. Or better yet, it is pleasurable to be strong because of the profits, painful to be weak because of the penalties. I wrong myself and the life that is in me if I return your money and forgo the pleasure of possessing it. But you are wronging me by withholding it, I objected. Not at all. One man cannot wrong another man. He can only wrong himself. We fell into discussion. Philosophy, science, evolution, religion. Wolf Larsen stormed the last strongholds of my faith with a vigor that received respect. Some days later, Larsen and I had been having a heated discussion. I passed severe strictures on the man and his life. I cut and slashed until the whole man was snarling. He sprang at me with a half roar, gripping my arm. The enormous strength of the man was too much for me. He had gripped me by the biceps with his single hand, and when that grip tightened, I wilted and shrieked aloud. It was days before I could use my arm again, yet he had done nothing but wrap his fingers around my muscle and close them with steady pressure. It might have been worse, smiled Larson. I was peeling potatoes. He picked one up from the pan. It was fair-sized, firm, and unpeeled. He closed his hand upon it and squeezed. The potato squirted out between his fingers in mushy streams. What, what a, a man. man! My God, that was satisfying! Nothing nicer than an autumn fire. What a glorious blaze. Did you ever think that little shed could create such a huge fire? The whole lot was lit up. And do you know what the best part was? Listening to the bystanders <laughs> speculate. What a bunch of dopes. And all those dumb cops with all their ridiculous theories. How did it start? Discarded matches? Faulty wiring? Crazy arsonists, ruthless anarchists. <laughs> and all those dumb cops claiming to have all the answers. Pathetically confident in their flimsy guesswork and so pleased with themselves. Pompous idiots. And the best part of all was that we knew the true solution to the mystery. Ourselves standing right there, totally unsuspected. <laughs> Hey babe, are you doing anything for New Year's? I'm going out with Richard Rubel. Richard Rubel? When did you make that decision? Well, we planned it ages ago. How early does one have to get one's name on your dance card? <laughs> Sorry, Dick, we got to talking and made a date. Well, break your date. Come out with me instead. I can't do that. I have a long-standing arrangement with Rubel. So? It would be atrociously bad manners. It would hurt his feelings terribly. But Rubel's an idiot. Dick, you're more than welcome to join us. Why don't you come along? Come along? Don't do me any favors. I can make my own arrangements. I better get going. Oh, Dick, wait. How could you make New Year's plans and not consult me? Dick, we made those plans last winter. You were in Michigan. I know why you made those plans. It's to get back at me for supposedly leaving you high and dry at Ann Arbor. I didn't know you were so vindictive. You want to be in the papers, Dick? Here's a headline. The world does not revolve around Richard Loeb. I made those plans without any reference to you. It's purely accidental benefit that now you understand how I felt, playing second fiddle to all your bros and so-called girlfriends. So-called? What's that supposed to mean? Never mind. No, you tell me oh. what you mean. <laughs> Don't act like a heavy unless you are a heavy. Would you be so kind as to tell me what you're hinting at? Nothing. All your girlfriends tell me what a gentleman you are. I should hope so. I go out with nice girls, babe. And so long as you're taking them out, they'll remain nice girls. Look, babe. Girls are fun to pal around with. They're excellent dance partners and they're great listeners. As for sex, it's really not that important to me. I can get along quite easily without it. I noticed. I'll have you know that I already have a date for New Year's. So why are you so sore I'm going out with Rupal? Because, in spite of my supposed self-centeredness, I found a date for you too. Oh. Well, I found this girl and she really wants to go out with me for New Year's. But her mother won't let her go unless there's a second couple. She's got a friend who'll go, but I have to find her a date. Thank you, Dick, for your thoughtful consideration of my New Year's pleasures, but 
I've already made a date with Richard Rubel, and I'm not breaking it so you can go out with some empty-headed flapper. So, Theodosius died of a heart attack <laughs> while having sex with Antonia. Oh, or as Gibbon put it, Theodosius expired in the first <laughs> fatigues of an amorous interview. <sighs> By the way, Belisarius' wife was named Antonina, not Antonia. Oh, right. Antonina. Sorry. I didn't have the benefit of Miss Struthers' pedagogical genius. You know, Dick, you didn't really appreciate her as she deserved. Miss Struthers, are you kidding me? I never met the woman, of course, but the way she prepared you for college, and she got you through high school, lickety-split. I never saw the point in that. Why push a kid through so many grades so young? I would have loved it. You were in college by 15. Wasn't that early enough? No sense wasting time. Such as, for instance, by playing with other kids? She didn't let you play with other kids? Hardly ever. Hmm. I had a governess named Sweetie. She didn't object to me playing with the other kids. It was the other kids who objected. They resented my intelligence, of course. I wasn't interested in their childish games anyway. Sour grapes, babe? I liked games. But Miss Struthers kept me indoors as much as she could. She said that playing with the other boys would turn me into... What? A boy. She said if I played rough games, I would be de-feminized. Her word. A lot of these spinster school moms want to turn boys into sissies. She went way beyond the ordinary school marm. She seemed to want me for her own. Her very own personal girly boy. She demanded total abject obedience. She had an eagle eye for the slightest infraction. If you cross her, there was hell to pay. And she was so possessive. First, she isolated me from the other kids. Then she wanted me to side with her against Mobsy. You must have been lonesome, not being allowed to play with the other kids. It was worse than that. I, I felt almost ashamed, as if I wasn't good enough to play with them. Did Miss Struthers ever catch you with them? Yes, of course, when I was younger. As I got older, I learned to be more elusive. Did you succeed? Generally. She did often suspect that I disobeyed, but I usually wriggled out of it. Developed fast talking into a fine art. You mean lying? Obviously. <clears throat> well, you lie to me often enough. I wish you wouldn't bother. I always find out. And you always forgive. I like to lie. <laughs> I used to lie to my parents even when there was no reason to. The other kids thought I was crazy. I'm inclined to agree with them. I get a kick out of it. I I've been lying so long now, sometimes I can't tell the difference between what's true and what's fake. How long was she with you? From the time I was six until I was 15. Hmm. She saw me through my freshman year at college, then she left. Put out to pasture? My parents asked her to tutor my younger brother, Tommy, but she refused and quit in a big huff. What happened to her? She moved east. We didn't hear from her for a couple of years. Then when I graduated from college, she showed up to congratulate me. It was so strange. We went to the Drake. She kept hinting that now that I was a man, I could give her all the love I owed her. She just sat there glaring at me. I think she was waiting for a proposal of marriage. I just froze. She got angry, gritted her teeth, and talking through her lips, hissing like a snake. And then she complained about men, how they followed her, demanded sex with their eyes. I paid the bill as quick as I could and hailed her a cab. She climbed into it without looking back or saying goodbye. Hell hath no fury. It was so weird because she had always been such a Puritan. Whenever we read Shakespeare, she skipped anything at all warm, as she called it. Whenever I asked her questions about sex, she just changed the subject. Sex was the only thing that Sweetie taught me. Really? 
What exactly? Where to put my schwanz. Really? How old were you? I don't know. Maybe 11 or 12. You're the one to be envied, not me. Where did she have you put it? She had me lie on top of her and put it between her legs. Oh, so that's where you learned that trick. Uh, so how long did Sweetie's lessons go on for? I don't really remember. In any case, she preferred my brother Sam. He was a better age for them. Did you get along with Sam? Not really. Fortunately, he mostly ignores me. I get along much better with Mike. I envy you that. Neither of my brothers ever gave me the time of day. They palled around together. I was just a nuisance. They didn't particularly like me. Oh, come on, Dick. I'm sure they liked you. It was just the age gap. No, they didn't. And if you want to know the truth, neither did my parents. Oh, come on. Of course you wouldn't understand. Your family adored you. <laughs> my brothers didn't know I existed. My mother was always so busy with her social engagements. And my father was always so strict and correct. I was afraid to tell him anything. At least you get along with Tommy. Yes. Tommy's a great playmate. I shadow him and he shadows me. Whoever makes the most observations without getting caught wins. I think you're too hard on your parents. I think not. Anyway, I better get going. Oh, Dick, wait. No, babe. Really. I should go. Sorry. Dicky, whatever your situation at home, you can always count on me. Yes. I know that. That's why I consider you my closest friend. <sighs> okay, okay, don't overdo it. Save it for Susan. Come in. Hi, hey babe. You asked me to drop by? Thank you, Dick. Come in. Sit down. What are you doing? Exactly what you did to me this afternoon. Now we're on the same footing, legally. What are you talking about? I'm talking about this afternoon. Explain yourself. Explain what? Why did you do it? You invite me into your car, slam the door behind me, step on the gas, and drive me off campus. I told you I didn't want to go. I told you I had a class. I told you to stop. Instead, you speed up. Were you afraid I'd jump out? G God damn it! How many times did I ask you to stop and you just kept driving faster and faster and further and further? So? Does the word abduction mean anything to you? Law school is getting to your head. You asshole! I swear to God, I'll kill you, dick! You wanted to die? I'll be more than happy to oblige you. Now tell me, why did you fucking kidnap me today? I would have told you in the car if you would just calm down and let me get a word in edgewise. Well? I was angry. You betrayed me to Dick Rubel. I wanted to have it out with you. How did I betray you to Dick Rubel? If anybody betrayed anybody, it was you who betrayed me. Oh, you're talking about New Year's Eve. Of course I'm talking about New Year's Eve. Why did you do that? Do what? God damn it, you fucker! I'll kill you! Why? Why did you do it? Why did I do what? I had an arrangement with Rubel. A long-standing arrangement. We, we were going to spend New Year's Eve together. You persuaded him to dump me and go out with you and those two bitches. I told you I had to find another guy to make up a second couple. And it had to be Rubel. Yeah. And guess what? I had no trouble persuading him. That girl is a lot prettier than you are. Rubel is a weakling. You shouldn't have interfered with my plans. Why did you betray me to Rubel? Damn you, what the fuck are you talking about? He knows. Knows what? About my... spells. What spells? My fainting spells. You must have told him. Oh, I sure as hell did not. I told you about those in absolute confidence. If you didn't tell him, then who did? Max Schreyer. Rubel was talking to him. Rubel told me he heard it first from you. That's a lie. Either he's lying or you're lying. Look. Rubel simply asked me, is it true what Max says, that Dick has bad fainting spells? I, I simply replied that based on what I had heard, I believe that you did. You should have said that I didn't. You should have lied. 
Or you should have just said that you didn't know. Who'd believe that? The whole frat knows about your spells. Wouldn't I at least have heard of them? Good God, Max Schreyer described them to me in detail. He said that your eyes were wide open, you were foaming at the mouth, your body went as rigid as a board. Shut up, God damn you! It's not fainting spells, it's fainting fits. I suspect it's what the Greeks called the sacred illness. Shut up. There's nothing sacred about it. I wake up and I'm drenched to my own saliva and everybody's looking at me as if I'm Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Listen, Dick. I don't want to talk about it. Okay, fine. But go ahead and call Rubel. Ask him. He'll tell you I betrayed no confidence. Go ahead. Call him. I will. Oakland 4270. Hello, Mrs. Rubel. May I speak to Richard, please? It's Richard Loeb calling. Thank you. Hi, Richard. It's Dick Loeb. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I'm not going to keep you too long. I just want to clarify something with you. Who was it that first told you about my spells? Was it Babe? Oh. Max. But Babe also told you, did he not? Oh. He just confirmed that he'd heard the same from Max. Okay. Okay. S said he believed it to be the case based on what Max had said. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. No, 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 everything's fine. Yes. Have a good evening, Richard, and I'll see you on Saturday. All right. Bye for now. Do you think I would intentionally betray you? I don't know. Dick, if you don't trust me, how can we be friends? Especially considering our capers. Good question. Well, Dick, you have now explained to me why you slammed me into your car and kidnapped me today. So I will refrain from killing you. Well, I may not refrain from killing you. I want to hear you admit that you acted wrongly by confirming Schreyer's story or by saying anything whatever about the matter. I want you to apologize. Otherwise, this is the end. Do you hear me? This is the absolute end of our friendship. But I did not act wrongly. Rubel asked me a direct question. There, there was no sense in saying I hadn't heard what was common knowledge. Now, if you don't accept that, do your worst. Kill me, break off our friendship, whatever. Accept it and we can go on together as before. You knew how I felt about those spells. Dick, I told you, I betrayed no confidence. Well, maybe not strictly speaking, but... Dick, if you insist on an apology from me, it's over between us. I will not admit to a wrong I did not commit. Well, let me just think about it. Well, you think about it, Dick. You might want to consider this. If you decide to break up our friendship, extreme care must be taken in both our interests. What the fuck are you talking about? Think about it, Dick. A pair of cocksuckers have a falling out? That's sure to prove a popular subject of gossip. If we break up, we must still observe the social conventions. Salutations in the street, a, a general appearance of at least not unfriendly relations. I'm not following you. People who are just friends drift slowly apart. They don't usually end their association by a sudden complete acrimonious rupture. If that is what we do, people will take it as proof that, just as they always suspected, we were more than just friends. God damn it! We're not at Ann Arbor anymore. Why does everyone think we're a pair of pansies? My friends wonder why I hang out with you. They ask each other what we can possibly have in common. They say that I'm selective in the company I keep, and you're indiscriminate. I'm serious, and you're frivolous. I'm genuine, and you're insincere. Oh yeah? Well, my friends say that I'm affable, and you're supercilious. I'm cheerful, and you're morose. I'm polite, and you're rude. But regardless, they see that there's something between us, and since it's not obvious what it is, they conclude there's only one thing it could be. I suppose so. Listen, Dick, I have to leave for Boston tomorrow afternoon. I know I have no right to ask you this, but 
I will for old time's sake. Will you let me know before midday tomorrow whether you want or do not want to continue our friendship? It would greatly help my peace of mind. Just phone and leave a message. Either Dick says yes or Dick says no. Dick says yes. Thank you, Dick. I greatly appreciate that. Well, you know, babe, one has to keep one's friends close, and one's enemies closer. The Emperor Justinian was lost if the prostitute whom he raised from the theater had not renounced the timidity as well as the virtues of her sex. In the midst of the crisis, Theodora alone displayed the spirit of a hero, and she alone could save the Emperor from imminent danger and his unworthy fears. If flight, said the consort of Justinian, were the only means of safety, yet I should disdain to fly. Death is the condition of our birth. But they who have reigned should never survive the loss of dignity and dominion. I implore heaven that I may never be seen, not a day, without my diadem and purple. That I may no longer behold the light when I cease to be saluted with the name of queen. If you resolve, O Caesar, to fly, you have your treasures. Behold the sea, you have your ships, but tremble, lest the desire of life should expose you to wretched exile and ignominious death. For my own part, I adhere to the maxim of antiquity, that the throne is a glorious sepulchre. As silent and stealthy as two cats. That went off quite well. By now the bros will be scratching their heads and wondering where all their stuff went. <laughs> What's eating you? I can't believe it. We drive six hours to Ann Arbor, rob one frat house, and score a grand total of $74, a typewriter, and some trinkets. Then another six hour drive back to Chicago. Hey, you wanted that typewriter and you got it, so shut up. We agreed to rob Delta Kappa as well as Zeta Beta Tau. It was too risky, I told you. All those guys sleeping on the porch, we could have woken them up. You just chickened out. I did not chicken out. I was being prudent. Prudent? You lost your nerve, as usual. We're halfway through a caper and you fizzle out. Get scared, lose your interest, I don't know. I have to pep you up and force you to finish whatever it is we've started. Who's the master criminal here, me or you? Who do you think you are? You were so arrogant wanting to rob Delta Kappa, you didn't even know the layout. I knew Zeta Beta Tau at the back of my hand. Then you should have known it wasn't worth robbing. Hey, you got that portable Underwood. You wanted that. I could have driven to Marshall Fields and bought a new one without risking some frat boy beating the shit out of me. You just don't get it. The point was not to score the wealth of Croesus, but to design and execute a perfect crime. A perfectly pointless crime. It's the thrill of it, babe. The thrill was not worth the 12-hour drive. Babe, I'm thoroughly tired of your bitching. So why is it me you call whenever you have some new adventure in mind? Well, I need somebody's assistance. You need my assistance. Your assistance? Baloney, I could find a new accomplice like that. Then why don't you? It's safer to stick with one. What do you mean, safer? 
you stick to one accomplice, there's only one person you need to trust. Not that I'm certain I can trust you. Well, I know I can't trust you. What do you mean? You lied to me. You've cheated me. When have I lied to you? When you boasted about your straight A marks at Ann Arbor. Oh, babe, would you give my marks a fucking rest? You've also cheated me. Remember when we went halves on that bottle of scotch? It cost you 20 bucks. You said it cost you 40, and I ended up paying for the whole thing myself. 20 bucks? That's no big deal. It is when you've cheated your best friend to get it. And now you want to get your revenge. If I were ever to get my revenge, I would have done it a month ago when you screwed up my New Year's plans. I was this close to killing you. And you think I've never thought of killing you? Me? Why? You've seen too much. You know too much. So why don't you then? If I could just snap my fingers and make you magically keel over with a fatal heart attack, I'd do it. But I can't murder you otherwise. Why not? Because I would be the prime suspect. Also, the idea of killing a fellow at close range is revolting. Don't be an ass, Richard. I could never expose you without implicating myself. I've been involved in every single one of your capers. The fact is that you'd betray me sooner than I'd betray you, and you know it. And I know you've looked for other accomplices. But you always return to me. I suspect you always will. Why? Because you need more than my assistance. You need my applause. My applause. Because I'm the only person whose opinion you value. I'm the only person worth impressing. It's my admiration that makes the thrill of the crime perfect. I'm finding the perfect crime more and more disappointing. Why? Because, babe, we've committed car theft, burglary, arson, all types of vandalism, all perfect crimes in the sense that we've never been caught, but our crimes have never made the papers. I guess our crimes are small potatoes. Then let's do something that's big potatoes. Our next adventure has got to be something that'll make people sit up and take notice. I want to read about it in the papers. What did you have in mind? A kidnapping. A kidnapping for ransom. Dick, kidnapping is a capital offense in this state. So what? We won't get caught. The cops are way too dumb to solve any crime of ours. Whom do we kidnap? It should be someone we know, of course. Someone who comes from a rich family. Someone who trusts us and can be lured easily into the trap. In that case, we'd have to kill him, otherwise he'd identify us later. Yes. Kidnap him, kill him, and collect the ransom on an already murdered victim. And all without ever being detected. We could dispose of the victim so his remains could never be found. Think of it. The money collected, but kidnappers and victim vanished without a trace. The perfect crime. I don't know, Dick. Committing two capital crimes at once? If they don't hang us for one, they'll hang us for the other. No, the... Kidnapping and the murder will be easy, you'll see. The tough part is collecting the ransom. It's too risky. Oh, I'll, I'll figure it out. A foolproof plan. My God, babe, it'll be a complete thrill. Best of all, it'll be front page news. It'll be your thrill, Dick, not mine. Now, well, I know what your thrill is. Really? Dick, I've almost forgotten. Good God, I spent hours and hours helping you plan and execute your crimes. I risk detection and arrest, and all for you to get your kicks. And what do I get out of it? Nothing. Do you expect me to go on like this indefinitely? You'll get your reward. Oh, sure I will. What's with you, Dick? Remember those early days at Charlevoix, when we first knew each other? We did it all the time, and we did everything. You wanted it as much as I did, all spring and summer when we were 15, like a couple of rabbits. Pave, a fellow's enthusiasm will wax and wane. My enthusiasm, as you call it, has not waned. That's because you're such a horny bugger. And you're such an unhorny bugger. Hell, Dick, I've never met a guy with such a sluggish libido. You don't even jerk off. I do it three times a day. Babe, I don't get the same thrill out of sex as you do. Obviously. The only reason you date all those girls is so you can go dancing. What's wrong with that? Now come on, you join me in this caper and I'll show you my appreciation. No, no, no way! 
You're always making these vague promises. You propose a caper, you rub my shoulders, you whisper in my ear. I agree to shoplift, break windows, set fires, burglarize, steal, shoot, and kill if need be. Then, when we're done, you're always, oh, I've got an exam tomorrow. I have to run errands for Mumpsy. I have a date tonight. You don't care about anybody but yourself. I've had it with all that. I'm finished. Babe, I'm sorry. It's too late for apologies. Babe. No, Dick. I've had it. I'm finished. There's nothing in this for me. So what will you do? I'm not doing anything. You're going to march out that door and never come back. What about all that gossip? Two cocksuckers falling out. I don't care anymore. People can say whatever they like. Babe, there's nothing I'd like better than to break up. But we can't. Do you understand? We can't. First, I don't want people thinking I'm a cake eater. Second, you've got too much on me. Go your way, Dick. As for your first problem, I can't help that. As for the second, I told you before, I will never expose you. Well, maybe I'll expose you. Ever think of that? Fine, Dick. Do your worst. I'm not afraid. I won't live with that threat hanging over my head. Fine, Dick. Then don't. Here's an opportunity, either to put yourself out of your misery, or for me to put myself out of mine. Either way, one of us can go on living free of any anxiety. We'll play poker. Best two out of three. Loser blows his brains out. I'll put the revolver in the middle of the table. Here are the cards, Dick. You can deal first. Babe, this is crazy. Is it? How many times have you told me you wanted to end it all? This could be your chance. But I'm not feeling depressed right now. But what about your fear of betrayal? Come on, shuffle. Whether you die or I die, you needn't fear me blabbing to the police about your peccadillos. Well? Three cards, please. Three cards. Well? I'm fine. Flush. Oh, come on. What do you have? One pair. My deal. Well, three cards. Just one, I think. Well, I don't want to play this stupid game. <laughs> just as I thought. Your suicidal talk is all just hot air, just a bid for pity. Good night, Richard, and while I'm at it, good riddance. You're right, babe. I have been selfish. Please, give me another chance. You do mean a lot to me, babe. There's no true, real friend for me but you. I know that.
Why do you make it so hard for me sometimes, Dick? You know that nobody appreciates you as I do. You know my opinion of you has never changed. Really? Really. I still think you're the most brilliant young man of this century. You are superior to everyone and in every way. But not to you, babe. Even to me. If you say so. But really, you're making me more stuck up than I am already. <laughs> Only you can fully realize Nietzsche's Ubermensch. You're above all the paltry, servile laws and customs of ordinary mortals. You can create your own laws out of the substance of your own desires. And you? Call me, if you will, a Nietzschean colossus, but one who serves an even greater colossus, a king among men. I imagine myself serving this king as his slave. Not an abject slave, mind you, but a powerful slave. One capable of rendering the highest service, both intellectual and physical, and with the most intense devotion. He offers me my liberty, but I refuse it so long as he remains a true king. I bind myself to him, but I bind myself with the most delicate golden chain, a chain that I can snap with just a flick of my wrist. But in all undertakings and dangers, I assist and protect the king, and with inexhaustible loyalty and fortitude. So what do you say about the current plan? The kidnapping? <laughs> we can finally commit a crime that will make the world sit up and take notice. It will be a perfectly conceived crime and perfectly executed. A crime worthy of our superior ingenuity. The police, the press, public will become completely baffled. We will read about it every day in the papers, and we, we alone, will know the truth behind the story. Years from now, people will still be talking about it. The great unsolved crime. It would be an interesting experiment. How would one feel doing something so extreme? What would be one's thoughts and emotions? Know thyself. This would be an opportunity, perhaps the opportunity. Most people are satisfied with living life at second hand. They read about it in books, but they'll never live it. They keep it at arm's length, so it becomes the fake life of culture and custom, of set commands and prohibitions which limit experience, or falsify it by filtering it through all kinds of artificial grids. The superior man grasps the true life of immediate perception in all its rawness. He rejoices in every facet of life, no matter what society says of it. Most people could never achieve such immediate, wonderful, and, and terrible knowledge. They wouldn't have the guts. Why should we not do it? Yes. Who else to undertake such a thing than those who are above human laws and restrictions? Yes. Beyond both good and evil. Listen, Dick. Before we set off on any new adventure, I think we should formalize our relationship. What do you mean? What are you doing? Just drawing up a little contract. Law school really has gone to your head. I didn't know you wore glasses. I don't really, but I've been having headaches. The doc suggested I try them. Do they help? Not really. So, what are we agreeing to? Richard, Albert, Loeb, and Nathan F. Leopold, Jr. agree to the following. Well, what do you want me to agree to? That the said 
Nathan F. Leopold Jr. will place himself absolutely at the service of the said Richard Albert Lowe for the purpose of participating in his projects. And Nathan Leopold will place himself absolutely under Richard Lowe's command. So long as any command that the said Richard Albert Lowe shall give does not make Leopold look ridiculous or result in injury or embarrassment to Leopold's family. Fine. And the said Richard Albert Lowe will indicate any commands to be absolutely obeyed and not vetoed without nullifying the terms of this agreement by prefixing to those commands the phrase for Robert's sake. <laughs> that dumb expression the college kids use? All right. And in exchange for his obedience and participation in his adventures, said Richard Albert Loeb shall yield his person to the said Nathan F. Leopold Jr. at a rate of three times every six weeks. That's once every two weeks. How many adventures do you imagine we're going to have? Three times every two months. Uh, Three times every two months, Dick. Otherwise, forget it. All right, all right. And this agreement shall persist until June 7th, 1924. Why? What happens then? I'm going to Europe. Going to Europe? For how long? A couple months. I'm sailing on the Mauritania. The Mauritania? You lucky shit. Yes. After that, this agreement is terminated. Anyway, I won't be around after that. Where will you be? Harvard Law School. Harvard? Not Chicago? Yes, I'm transferring. How could you make such a decision and not tell me? Do what? Why? Do I need your permission? No, but I'm your closest friend. I, I didn't expect that I wouldn't be seeing you next year. You'll see me. When you deign to visit. Why? What are you planning for next year? I'm going to Chicago Law School. You didn't tell me that. Recent decision. So you have chosen a profession? Yes. The law. Well, I thank you, Dick. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And you know, Teddy, I can see myself. A criminal mastermind. In jail and in chains. Guards are brutes. They strip me of every stitch of clothing. I'm stark naked. They thrust me from one man to another. Their arms are powerful. Their hands are calloused. They pull their belts from their pants. They strap me unmercifully. The leather is so sharp, it bites. So deep. On the other side of the bar stands a huge crowd of men, women, and children. Boys and pretty little girls. They've come to see the famous criminal punished. I'm the author of the greatest, most elaborate, most beautiful and baffling crimes ever committed. Now, as the men Women and children watch me, bare, bullied, manhandled, whipped and kicked. Their hearts are broken for me, especially the little girls. Their cheeks are wet with tears. Everyone wonders how I, I so much to be admired and pitied, should be so rudely stripped my body exposed to the eyes of the world. My proud, erect stature humbled. I crawl on my hands and knees. All I can see are the sturdy legs of my persecutors, like a pillared enclosure all around me. My tender flesh is bruised and bleeding. My ribs and shoulders ache from relentless fists. My bare limbs are streaming with my own sweat. 
and the sweat of my captors falls on my back in salty showers. My captors, my tormentors, vast, vicious, pitiless, powerful, implacable barbarians. I propose we make a list of possible victims. It has to be someone we know, who trusts us, and who comes from a rich family. We could kidnap our dads. Which one? Hardly matters, but my dad is richer than yours. But the kidnapped dad would be the one in control of the money. It would be very difficult to collect the ransom if we've kidnapped the very person who would pay the ransom. Very true. We could kidnap my younger brother, Tommy. I thought he was your favorite brother. He is. All right, but we have a problem. All members of the family will be under close watch by police. It would be difficult to elude them long enough to collect the ransom. Good point. What about Dick Rubel? There'd be no trouble getting him in the car. We could get him drunk, then pow! And do you know what the best part would be? I would almost certainly be asked to be a pallbearer at the funeral. What a delicious irony. I thought the body was never to be found, or at least never identified. Ah, that's right. Gosh, that's too bad. Rubel's dad is a tightwad anyway. He'd probably never pay the ransom. What about that asshole who first spread rumors about us? Hamlin Buckman. Yes, we could finally get our revenge on him. That would be satisfying. But how much does he weigh? I don't think you and I together could lift that lard ass. And there's another thing. We might be suspected. People would know that we had a motive for killing him. Besides, mm. let's leave out any adults. Their bodies would be too large and heavy to dispose of easily. What about a young girl? We could even stretch and complicate the crime. What do you mean? On top of kidnapping her, we could rape her. Why? It's the thing to do. You've read those stories, how the Germans would capture French girls, strap them to tables, and have sex with them? I believe a lot of those stories were anti-German propaganda. Anyway, I think not. Girls are guarded rather closely. They're more difficult to abduct. A boy would be better. Safer. All right. Do you have anyone in mind? I don't know. What about Johnny Levinson? Oh, of course. I should have known Johnny Levinson. What do you mean now? Oh, please. I heard about Tommy's birthday. You grabbed Johnny Levinson, put him over your knee, and spanked him. It was a joke. Levinson complained there was something about that spanking he didn't like. Yeah, like the fact that it was a spanking. Look, Johnny's dad is a rich attorney. I'm putting him down as a definite maybe. Fine. Who else? Billy Deutsch. His granddad's Mr. Rosenwald, the chairman of Sears Roebuck. Your dad's boss? Yeah. Well, maybe that's not such a good idea. Well, we can work on the list. So once we've chosen a victim, how do we kidnap him? We lure him into a car. We render him unconscious, a good swift blow to the head. When we get to our disposal site, we finish him off. How? I don't know. Why don't you chloroform him like one of your birds. Then I'll be the actual killer, no way! Oh, and I suppose you want me to kill him so you can have even more dirt on me. N no, no, no. We must bear equal responsibility. All right. Look, we take a length of rope along. We put the rope around the neck of the unconscious boy. You pull on your end, I pull on my end. Equal guilt. That sounds better. Where do we dispose of the body? There's a spot up at Wolf Lake, a sort of swamp. I've often gone birding there. It's very lonely and isolated. There's a culvert running under a railroad embankment. We can put his body in there. No one will ever find him, or by the time somebody does, his body will be decomposed beyond recognition. Still, we should take steps to obliterate any marks of identification. How? Acid. Hydrochloric, or maybe sulfuric. Pour it on the face? Yes, 
and on any other identifying marks. Also, the genitals. Why the genitals? Some people have very peculiar looking genitals. They could be identified by them. I don't think I've ever seen such peculiar genitals. My brother Tommy's cock is really weird. Okay, fine, but once we've disposed of the body, how do we collect the ransom? That will be the most exciting and intricate part of the scheme, to collect the ransom without ourselves getting caught. Only a true master of crime could figure out a foolproof method of doing that. Then I will leave that in your capable hands for now. Yes. Anyway, I'd better get going. You have a date with Lorraine? No, with Patches. Patches Reinhardt? That dizzy flapper? I thought she was your Wednesday date. She's been promoted to Saturday. She's such a laugh, babe, and a brilliant dancer. What happened to Lorraine? She's been your Saturday date forever. I got tired of her. Oh, come on. If you were going to get tired of her, it would have happened long before now. Chances are she's got tired of you. She got some complaint against you. Actually, babe, it's you she doesn't like. Me? Yes. She says I spend too much time with you. A little possessive. And she thinks you're a bad influence on my character. Me? What did you do to her? Nothing. I just thought she had more sense of adventure. What happened? You know I like fast driving and taking a few perfectly safe chances. Who doesn't? So I was taking Lorraine for a drive. I saw this guy walking on the side of the road, so I turned the car and made for him. He saw me at the last second and dove into a ditch. Oh my God, it was hilarious. You should have seen the look on his face. He thought he was going to die. And my whole body was electrified. Lorraine didn't see the excitement. Fuck, she scolded me. Said that palling around with you had warped me. I think she's just jealous, the bitch. Anyway, she told me to take her home immediately. Well, Susan thinks you're a bad influence on me. And she's not the only one. My father phoned my birding buddy, Jim Watson. He said he was worried about me. Or rather, worried about my friendship with you. What? Asked Jim to talk to me. What about our friendship? I don't know. Jim never told me. He just laughed. Thought it was a joke, I guess. Or maybe he was too embarrassed to discuss it. Or maybe he thinks my old man is just a worrier. Nobody has ever wanted us to be together. For years now, people have been trying to break us up. First the guys at ZVT, then my friends, then your friends, then Lorraine, then Susan, and now your dad. People should mind their own fucking business. You sure like churches, babe. I sort of collect them. What do you mean? When I was a kid, I was fascinated by them. It was the variety of their design. Uh, look, that one's neoclassical. That's high gothic. It's Romanesque. Yes, yes, I did study fine art at college. Anyway, I, I collected churches the same way I collected beetles and butterflies and birds. Only I didn't bring them home, obviously. <laughs> Just made mental notes. My poor family, I made them drive me all over town to see as many as I could. Hmm. I was also interested in the different denominations. Catholic, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Congregationalist, Methodist. Later on, I studied the different doctrines. Thinking of joining the Gentiles? <laughs> Certainly not. Ah, oh, you know I don't believe in God. I don't even consider myself a Jew. Really? If I don't believe in God, and I consider every aspect of religion as a waste of time, I can hardly be a Jew. Makes sense. My momsy is a Catholic. Really? I didn't know that. I always wondered why you looked so gentile. First time you dropped your drawers, I expected to see a foreskin. Sorry to disappoint you. In any case, my m mom wasn't very happy when my dad insisted we be brought up Jewish. But what did she expect? <laughs> what are these? My god, crucifixes? <laughs> Classifying these as well? Nah, I just like looking at them. Why? I find them appealing. In what way? The idea of nailing someone's body up to something appeals to me. That's weird. I like the idea of having complete jurisdiction. 
complete control over someone else's body. It, it fascinates me. You mean it excites you? Obviously. Dick, you remember that game we used to play? Where you pretended you were drunk? No, not tonight. What do you mean, not tonight? I spend some part of almost every day helping you plan your criminal magnum opus. And it's been over six weeks now. You're way overdue. Babe, I'm tired. So what? You don't have to do anything. You're not breaking our contract, I hope. Certainly not. You begged off last week. Okay, just give me another drink. <laughs> You're past pretending already. <sighs> Come on. Oh, babe, surely you won't take advantage of my vulnerable condition. Oh, you bet I will. Oh, babe, you spilled my drink. Oh, don't worry. I won't let you go without. There. <laughs> you masher, you brute. <laughs> you priapian menace. Resistance is futile. Your body belongs to me. Okay, so we aren't using my car as the kidnap vehicle. No, the color is too conspicuous. You will rent a car under an alias. What if they ask for some identity card or something? They won't. I told you. They'll just ask for the number of a reference. That will be me. You give them the number of a public phone, I'll be there to answer the call. What if someone is using the public phone? Then they'll just have to call back. Don't worry, I'll still be there. Okay. So, we have the car, but we still haven't chosen a victim yet. We've shadowed half a dozen boys going home from school. Whom do we kidnap? Whichever one of them is available. Look, we don't know who will be within reach on any given day, but on any given day, someone will present himself. We'll let fate decide. So we'll leave it to chance? Yes. So the killing will be random? Yes. It doesn't matter whom we kill so long as his dad is rich. At least one of the boys on our list will appear, or perhaps some other equally eligible boy whom we haven't considered. It doesn't matter. I'm not sure I feel comfortable with the randomness of this scheme. What do you want to do, make an appointment with the victim? Don't worry about it. Okay, so once he's in the car, we knock him out? Yes. The boy will sit up front with the driver. One of us will be sitting in the back seat. I, or rather, whichever one of us is in the back seat, will strike him with the handle of the chisel. Then, we'll drag him into the back seat, drive him out to Wolf Lake, and strangle him. A single blow might not knock him out. Then he'll be howling and screaming in the front seat. We'll keep the windows up. Someone might see him thrashing about. Listen, babe, the blow will be really hard. He'll be out before he knows anything hit him. I don't know. Have you ever tried to knock somebody out before? It might not be as easy as you think. Well, how about I practice on you, then? For weeks now, you've been throwing up objections to every single detail of the plan. We decide on a course of action one week, and the next week you've punched a hundred holes in it. I have to deal with every single one of your objections. And so the plan improves. Good. The plan is as perfect as it's ever going to be. Last week you were going on and on about the ransom. 
this week is the actual kidnapping. I told you the, rant, the kidnapping and the murder were going to be easy. It's collecting the ransom that will be the most difficult. And yet now we've worked that out perfectly. So why on earth are you going on about anything? Just making sure we've considered all the possibilities. We have considered all the possibilities. Nathan, when did you say your boat leaves for Europe? June 7th. Exactly. Just over three weeks from today. You don't think I know what you're up to? God damn it, Nathan. You're trying to stall the plan long enough for you to get on your boat and sail off to Europe. You're chickening out. When have I ever chickened out of anything? You're always the one who gets cold feet. If you pull out on me, babe, after all these months of planning, I'll walk out that door and you'll never see me again. I said I'll do it. You'll go through with it? Of course. You don't say that with much conviction. I mean what I say, Dick. I'm not a quitter. And you're prepared to prove it? You'll go through with the whole thing. Kidnapping, murder, ransom? Yes. You remember our contract, babe? You promised to be totally at my command. Especially when I say, for Robert's sake. And I suppose you're saying that now. I sure as hell am. I know how you feel, babe. Even I get cold feet sometimes. Hell, my brother Ernie on his wedding night, his feet were nearly frozen. But he went through with it. I intend to have equal fortitude. So do I. Good. Now, next week is your exams. The week after that, you're heading to Europe. That means this week is the only week we can do this. All right. What day is good for you? Not Monday. Tuesday, Mopsy has me running all kinds of errands. Friday, I've got my date with Patches, and you're seeing Susan. I think it's got to be Wednesday. All right. Uh, I've got a lecture in the morning, but I'm free the rest of the day. Great. It's Wednesday, May 21st. Put that in your book. We've been planning this job for months. We've discussed every detail ad nauseum. We've planned for every contingency. Wednesday will be the day. Now I watched the Archibasir, the one who had killed my brother. I watched him as if he were a girl and I was madly in love with him. What added so much to my agonized resentment was that he boasted of the murder. The killer lived near a place called the Torre Sanguina. He stood in the doorway, sword in hand. I crept up, stealthily, and with a dagger, dealt him a backstroke, intending to cut his head clean off. But he wheeled around suddenly, and the blow fell on top of his left shoulder, shattering the bone. Up he sprang, and, dazed by the terrible pain, he threw aside his sword and took to flight. I followed after, and caught up with him in a step or two. Then, raising my dagger above his bent head, I struck him on the nape of the neck. The weapon went in so deep that I could not, for all my efforts, pull it out. Just then appeared four soldiers clutching their swords. I abandoned the dagger and took to my heels. <coughs> you told me it wasn't going to be like that. You said it would be easy. You'd knock him out with a good swift blow to the head, then we would drive him up to Wolf Lake and strangle him. It was supposed to be clean and bloodless. It's okay, babe. It's okay? It was horrible. You hit him and hit him and hit him. I could hear him struggling in the back seat, kicking his feet, howling and yelling, and all the while, thud, thud, thud on his skull, splashes of blood flying everywhere, on, on the back of my neck, on my sleeve, on my hand holding the wheel. So sorry, babe. I know it's distressing. He was much more resilient than I expected. <sighs> oh, 
the animal brutality of it. You said it wasn't going to be like that. I didn't think it would be so difficult to knock a guy out cold. Oh, come on. It was hard for me, too. Good God, his legs were thrashing under me, and his fists were everywhere. That little punk got me right in the groin. And those choking sounds when I shoved the handkerchief down his throat. Oh, disgusting. But it was the only way I could subdue him. You mean that after all that battering, you had to choke him to death? I guess he did suffocate. I guess the back seat is a mess now. I guess it is. We'll have to scrub it. We'll have to... It'll take us hours to clean it. We'll have to expunge every spot. Don't worry, babe. I'll do it. I'll provide the elbow grease. You won't have to do a thing. Where is he? On the floor in front of the seat. I threw a blanket over him. That blanket is probably a mess now, too. We'll have to burn it. Sure, babe. We can burn it in my furnace later. It was the sheer animal brutality of it. That's what upset me so much. Of course, babe. I'm sorry. I should have anticipated the difficulty. Live and learn, huh? That's okay, Dick. Tell you what, I'll drive for a while. You relax. When we get to the dew drop in, I'll buy you something to eat. Thanks, Dick. I, I appreciate it. Great. You hungry? I sure am. Would like nothing better than a red hot and a beer. Everything will be okay. You'll see. Everything will go as smooth as silk. Nothing can possibly go wrong from here on in. I can't believe it, Dick. I can't believe you told the state's attorney that I killed Bobby. My God, it's bad enough that you cracked under pressure and confessed, but did you have to say that I was the one who did the actual killing? Are you kidding? If my dad ever found out that I killed Bobby, there'd be hell to pay. But you know full well I could never have killed him or anybody with such cold-blooded brutality. Neither could I. But you did! And then you lied about it! I was mad at you, goddammit. Why did you use that alibi? You made me look like a complete fool. We agreed we'd use that alibi if we were picked up less than seven days after the crime. And we were picked up more than seven days after the crime. I was picked up at 2 p.m. on Thursday. That was two and three-quarter hours less than a week after the crime. It sure as hell was not. A week since the crime was Wednesday at 11 a.m. That's when the crime was initiated. Yeah. I reckoned the week from the moment the crime was terminated. Well, that was dumb. Well, no dumber than your reckoning. Oh, for God's sake, by your own stupid calculation, you were picked up when the week was almost expired. I told you that the police could not reasonably expect you to remember the trivialities you've been up to more than a week before. They kept at me like bulldogs and wouldn't take I can't remember for an answer. It was extremely suspicious that no matter how I racked my brains, I couldn't remember the events of seven days prior. But our alibi was nothing but trivial, forgettable details. Like picking up two floozies and getting laid. Totally inconsequential. If you ever did anything more with a girl than just go dancing, you'd never forget. And you'd never let anyone else forget. Any more of your low, disgusting insinuations? The fact remains that no matter how they badgered me, I stuck to our story and wouldn't budge. And while you were reciting our whole alibi in detail, I was sitting in the next room going, Duh, I don't remember. You made a complete fool out of me. The point is that I stuck to our story no matter how many holes they tried to poke in it. And you know what? They were starting to believe me. I could see they were giving up the game. They were about to send me home. And then bang, you crack. And after what, an hour of interrogation? I wouldn't have had to say anything if you hadn't used that alibi, goddammit. There was a huge hole in our story and the police found it. Well, that wasn't my fault. We told the police that we'd picked up the girls in your car. Then your chauffeur waltzes into the station and says, oh, the boys can't be guilty. Nathan's car was in the garage all day. Well. I'll admit we ought not to have used a lie that could be so easily exposed, but you should have insisted that Sven was mistaken. I did. The jig was up. 
No, it wasn't. If you maintain anything with enough confidence, people will believe you. But you had no endurance. You just crumpled like the cream puff you are. I never realized you were such a weakling. Wait a minute. Maybe you weren't a weakling. Maybe you were a fucking traitor. Maybe you confessed so fast you could pin the whole thing on me and save your pusillanimous hide. Thought you could turn state evidence on me and get a deal. Thought you could set me up for the gallows so you could get a lighter sentence, you vicious, double-crossing, filthy little cocksucker. The Superman is above morality. You're not above morality, you fucking reptile. You're beneath it. Well, whatever I was doing, I told you. The jig was up. They'd found your glasses at the scene of the crime. My glasses didn't prove anything. I go to Wolf Lake all the time. I could have dropped them in that spot on any one of a hundred occasions. I told them that, and they believed me. It was those glasses that first led the police to us. And whose fault was that? You're the one who dropped them, remember? You picked my jacket up by the hem, not by the collar. Who does that? Of course my glasses fell out. Well, you didn't stick Bobby's body deep enough into the culvert. His feet were sticking out for all to see. I couldn't push him in any further, goddammit. That culvert was tight. Also, I was choking on the fumes from the acid. What a terrible idea. The acid washed off in the water, didn't disguise his identity one jot. It was an excellent idea. It just didn't work. Well, never mind all that now. I want you to retract what you said about me killing Bobby. Never. Listen, Dick, it doesn't matter which one of us did the deed. Under the law, we are both equally guilty. We'll get exactly the same sentence, so why don't you just tell the truth? No. In all this horror, my parents have only one shred of comfort. The possibility that I was not the Archfiend. And your parents can have the same consolation if you say that I did it. But the truth must have some value. Maybe for you. You're the philosopher, not me. I have to write to Momsy and Popsy. What am I going to say? How am I going to explain? How did I get into this mess? How did the whole thing come about? I'm asking myself the same question. One thing is sure. You've been a bad influence on me. Me? How? The way you facilitated me in these criminal projects. Without you, I would never have done anything. What? You're the bad influence. Before I met you, it had never even occurred to me to commit a crime. You concocted the schemes, and then you asked me, ordered me to assist you. Why did you fall in with my wishes so easily? You had some nefarious design. You said that you were the master criminal. I've never committed any crime, except jointly with you. That may be so, but... You've always dominated me, babe. Me? Yes, with your superior intellect, your unfathomable cunning. You buttered me up, claimed I was so much smarter than you. But you were always the smarter one. You lulled me into a false complacency. Then. You devised covert strategies to lead me. Lead you? It was my job to obey, for Robert's sake, remember? Captain Shoemaker thinks I was merely a tool in your hands. Oh, I get it. Yet again, you're looking for some loophole, some mitigating circumstance so that you can get off with a lighter sentence. Well, that one won't work. Even if I had dominated you, in the eyes of the law, you're still an equal agent in this whole affair. But I- Now you listen to me, Dick. I'm not getting into this discussion with you. What's done is done. If you want to disclaim responsibility, lie, and point the finger at me, good luck to you. It would be just like the slimy double-crosser and abject coward that you are. As for my part, whatever influences I've been under, I'm responsible for my own part in this whole affair. I feel no remorse for what we did, nor no fear of the consequences. I got myself into this mess, and now it's up to me to get myself through it as best I can. For my part, I choose the only path consistent with a superior individual. I'm guilty. They caught me. 
I'm resolved to take my punishment like a man. That's exactly how I feel, babe. There's no loophole for me, I guess. If you're guilty, then so am I. Life is what you make of it, and I've made mine what it is today. I can't say that I feel remorseful, except for the trouble I've caused Momsy and Popsy. I'm not afraid of what's to happen next. Good. Babe, do you think we'll hang? I wouldn't be surprised. Although I've never lived the part, I shall die in a manner worthy of my family. I think if we hang, I'll concoct an experiment to prove the existence of another world, if there is such a world. Do you know what the worst thing about hanging is? What? Not being able to read about it next day's paper. If they don't hang us, what else might they do? Lock us up and throw away the key? Maybe that wouldn't be so bad. Oh, I'm sure you'll love it. I feel quite at home here in the county jail. Like I belong. You do belong. I love the bullpen, talking to the fellas, coaching my baseball team, leading the sing song. And I get a real kick helping out in the jail schoolroom. Some of those guys don't know how to read. I get a lot of satisfaction teaching them. Especially the prettier ones. I wonder what Joliet will be like. I've heard it's a hellhole. They don't even have toilets, just slop buckets. Do you think we'll be allowed to share the same cell? Dick, I doubt they'll let us share the same prison. What do you mean? I hear they're building a new prison up at Crest Hill. I suspect they'll send one of us there. Those fucking assholes, they're gonna split us up? Maybe we'll see each other on the high holidays. That won't be enough, babe. You're the closest friend I've ever had. And now you're all I have left. Are you trying to butter me up? I'm stating a fact. Listen, babe, since we are equally guilty, we need to stop arguing over the past and think about the future. We've quarreled before, but we've always overcome our differences. That's because we couldn't afford to break up. And we certainly can't afford to now. We're both in for the same ride. We might as well ride together. And that's the only reason you'd want to stay with me. Because we're in the same fix. Of course not, but I'd say it's an adequate reason. I'm not sure it's adequate for me. Oh, come on, babe. You know I'm fond of you. Really? You just tried to have me hanged. I told you I was angry. Have you got any real friendship for me? Whenever there's been a breach between us, I've always been the one to step up and offer the olive branch. Well, that is true. And that tells you something about my friendship for you. Or about your fear of exposure. Oh, come on, babe. Deep down, I never really believed that you'd betray me. Then why did you say it? I didn't want to lose your friendship. Then why didn't you say so? You just wanted an accomplice. No, babe, I've always liked you for your own sake. Remember when I first met you? When we were 15? I sought you out. You didn't seek me. You didn't even like me. But I was attracted to you. You seemed like a straight up fellow. I was determined to make friends with you. I didn't give up till I'd succeeded. Are you saying you actually have some affection for me? Of course. Of course I do, babe. How can you doubt it? I wonder if mere affection is enough to keep two guys together who've wanted to kill each other. Well, there's also been a lot of common circumstances between us. The circumstances are external. I'd always hoped that deep down you felt something for me, like true friendship. I do. I do, babe. Really? Have you really felt it? Deep down, or, or was it just a stance? Oh, I don't know, babe. I'm not even sure what true friendship feels like. That doesn't surprise me. Do you even like me? Of course. Of course I do, babe. Don't do that! For God's sake, I need you. 
need me? What do you need me for? Apparently, for my own destruction. Also, I need you for your esteem. That I believe. And you've needed me too. Needed you? No. I've always liked you for who you are. Oh, babe, don't be a hypocrite. A hypocrite? How can you say that? How can you say that I don't like you? What's to like? Well, if I needed you, what did I need you for? I have no idea. But you've always needed me for something. What makes you say that? Because there's no other reason why you'd have stuck with me as long as you have. Well, Dick, as you say, we've quarreled before and made up. I suppose we have to do that now. We have to stand by each other. No one else will stand with either of us. And we'll leave the question open as to which of us did the deed? Agreed. Gee, it wouldn't be great if I could go to sleep and wake up where the lazy daisies grow. One I love and two I love and three I'd love to wonder where the lazy daisies grow. Life to me would always be a holiday Down in the fields that I once knew Cause if it satisfies the bees and butterflies Then I'd be satisfied too Just like Huckleberry Finn I'd wear a grin if I were in the land of a sunny smiles just to see the one I love, the one I'm always dreaming of, I'd walk a million miles. That is where the world is fair as paradise, a little buddy told me so. Oh, gee, it wouldn't be great if I could go to sleep and wake up where the lazy days.